Please join me in welcoming a great American patriot and our friend, Brent Bazell. Thank you, Diana. That's very nice of you. And it's, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I just want to make sure. Um, how many of you all believe that the, the Pope is Catholic? Okay. Okay. How many of you believe that Friday follows Thursday? How many of you believe the media are biased? I just, I just want to make sure I'm in the wrong right room here. Uh, what the heck are we going to talk about today? We've got 29 minutes to speak. I think we're going to take some Q&As. Let's talk about this train wreck that happened last year and why exactly it happened. There are a lot of theories. There are a lot of explanations. Uh, one of the things that really strikes me is the Republican Party announcing that it was doing an autopsy of the party to determine what happened. No, no, folks. You perform autopsies on cadavers, on corpses. So today we're going to talk about messaging, beginning with the, they ought to do an autopsy and whoever came up with the word autopsy for the Republican Party. Um, th this was a year where all manner of things went wrong. And in fact, I would submit to you that Barack Obama was, in my estimation, the single most vulnerable incumbent in modern history. There was no excuse, none whatsoever, for the Republicans not to be in the White House today and for the Republicans not to have captured the Senate. No excuse whatsoever for it. And heads have got to roll about that. But let's talk about the role that the, the media played in all of this. Uh, it was about 2010 that I, I ran into Steve Forbes at a reception and he asked me, how, how bad, really, were the media in 2008? And I, I said, 100% uh, pro-Obama. And he said, well, how's it going to be in 2012? And I said, worse. And uh, he said, well, how can it be worse? And I said, well, because in 2008, they were 100% vested in the election of uh, Barack Obama. In 2012, they're going to be vested in his reelection and in the destruction of anyone who gets in his way. They didn't worry about John McCain, they're gonna worry this time around. And in fact, that's precisely what happened. There are three themes that you can follow in the 2012 election cycle. Promote, bury, and destroy. What do I mean by that? Promote, everything about Barack Obama that he wanted in 2012 was promoted. I will challenge you here and now. Can anyone here recall a single interview where he was held accountable for anything? Can you tell me a single interview with Brian Williams, with Scott Pelley, with anyone at CBS, ABC, CNN, where they held him to account for his record? Can you tell me interviews where they even brought up his record? Instead, we know all about how Michelle wants us to eat right. We know about all of his living standards. We know that the birds above the, wall, the mall were singing when he was sworn in. That's what ABC told us. Um, we know all manner of things about the Almighty. But we don't know anything if we are a, the standard guy out there watching ABC, NBC, CBS, or CNN about what it was that he did or didn't do in the first four years. It was clear-cut promotion. And here's something else that's interesting. The message that, and it was smart politics, the message that went from the White House to the media were, if you don't treat us that way, we're not gonna do interviews with you. They were very selective. They went on MTV, they did you know, powerhouses like that, uh, The Daily Show, I mean, it's really intellectual firepower there. Um, but they wouldn't do the networks unless the networks genuflected in front of them. And so the networks genuflected, which wasn't hard because they were genuflecting for four years. So you know, their knee pads were, were all straightened out for this. So it was, it was nonstop promotion. The second one was to bury. Anything that got in the way of the reelection of Barack Obama was buried. Now you all, if I asked you right now, 
Who here is familiar with Fast and Furious? Okay, now let me ask you, how many of you watch Fox News? All right, cause and effect going on here. Um, if you watch CBS, I guarantee you, you don't know what Fast and Furious is. This is something we conservatives don't really focus on. That all of our friends, all the people we know, think like we do perhaps, and know what we know, and, th and do what we do. But the average person out there who doesn't watch Fox News, who doesn't read the Washington Times, who doesn't go to the Drudge Report, doesn't know things like Fast and Furious. Why? Because the networks would not report it. And they did not report it, except for finally a scattered story here and there, but they didn't cover it. Benghazi, show of hands. Who's familiar with Benghazi? Well, guess what? The average person isn't. The average person didn't focus on it. Or if the average person heard about it, it was something that happened in Libya, but there was no problem where the administration was concerned. They had no clue what the facts were in that. They were no, had no clue about one, that it, it was a, a, a focus on the sheer incompetency and incoherence of this administration. And secondly, that there was a real scandal involved when the UN, the ambassador to the UN, goes on five different shows on a Sunday morning and lies on every single one. Where in the presidential debate, Barack Obama lied. And, and, and uh, Candy Crowley of CNN abetted that lie when he said he had called it terrorism the first night, when he hadn't. Nobody called him out on that on the networks. They actually, as I just said, they gave him, gave him air cover on that. So the average person has no idea about the awful things. The average person doesn't know that he said that if he couldn't get joblessness under control, that he shouldn't be reelected. The average person doesn't know that not only was the jobless figure 8.1, 8.2, whatever it might be, but in fact, when you factor in the people who were walk, working only part-time or the people who had given up looking for jobs, the unemployment rate is closer to 15% in this country. And with minorities, it's closer to 25%. Ask the average person out there. He doesn't know. So focus on the average person out there going to the polls. If the average person going to the polls doesn't know the facts, how in the world can you expect there to be an even playing field? Third, destroy. There was a level of character assassination this year, uh, unlike anything I've ever seen before. And we said it was going to happen, but I've got to tell you, even I didn't see what was coming. Go through the primary process, and let's walk through every single candidate and what the media did to that candidate. Every candidate who showed up as one person and left as quite another. They began with Sarah Palin who wasn't even a candidate. But just in case she might be a candidate, here came a, a preemptive attack. Think about this. When somebody wanted to write a book about her, he actually took a house right next door to her rental home and basically stalked her and stalked her family. Now, can you imagine what would be the media reaction if somebody took a house next to Barack Obama to do the, exactly to him what this person did to Sarah Palin? There would be absolute hell to pay for that. Yet there was nothing said about it. Think about all the books that have come out where no one, Barack Obama's two books that have come out where nobody questions the facts that are laid out by the author. Now think about this. When Sarah Palin came out with her book, the AP assigned not one fact checker, not two fact checkers, not three fact checkers, not four fact checkers, not five fact checkers, not six fact checkers, not seven fact checkers, not eight fact checkers, but nine people to fact check that book to try to find anything they could against her. She was disposed of. Next comes Michelle Bachman. And Michelle Bachman was immediately portrayed as a nut by the national news media. That's how she was presented. Again, perception is reality. 
Your perception of Michelle Bachman is one thing, but the broad public that knew nothing about Michelle Bachman learned something else. I want to backtrack for just a second here. Newt Gingrich learned this lesson, or didn't learn the lesson, the hard way. When he and the contract with America won in November of uh, 1994, there was great celebrations in the Republican ranks, but they didn't understand something, which was that the average person knew nothing about the contract with America. What had happened was they had sold this in a, a, a few very specified districts enough to win the election, but the broad country didn't know what the contract with America was. Between election day and December 31st of 1994, which is the period that Newt Gingrich was introduced to the American people, how many stories between radio, between, uh, not radio, newspaper, magazines, and television, how many stories introducing Newt Gingrich were positive? What percent of the stories were neutral? What percent of the stories were negative? I'll save you the time. 100% negative. Every single story done about Newt Gingrich introducing him to America was negative. By the end of December, he had an approval rating of 27%. And I don't know who the hell those 27% are. I wouldn't have liked them if I was the average person. This is exactly what was happening to the Republicans. Michelle Bachman was introduced. She was introduced as a crazy loon. Look at the cover they did of her on Time Magazine where they distorted her picture to make her look almost somewhere between crazy and satanic. I'm not sure which one it was. But they attacked her, they vilified her, they ridiculed her. And at the end of the day, she was marginalized. So she's out of the way. Next comes Herman Cain. Now Herman, I know all these guys, Herman's just a, a good, nice fellow. Um, but they wanted to take him out because Herman poses a different kind of threat. He's black and he's a black conservative. And that is what kneecaps liberalism, and ultimately will kneecap liberalism. An articulate leader who happens to be black in the conservative movement. So they went after him. In journalism, there's a rule that says that you have to have two sources for a story, or you shouldn't do a story. Do you realize there were, one, there were 97 network news stories done on Herman Cain and the allegations of womanizing before a single woman was named. Meaning, they did 97, which is an avalanche, an absolute avalanche of stories, 97 stories on him without having a single source, just having gossip. That was perfectly okay. Now think Jennifer Flowers. Think Paula Jones. Think about all those other scandals. Well, what were we told by the media? Move on, move on, we need to move on. Well, with Herman Cain was back up, back up, back up. And let's cover that one. He's disposed of. Who comes next? Rick Perry. And Rick's a good guy too. But then we learned, among other things, we learned that in 1982, I believe it was, there was a rock. There was a rock on a ranch that his family didn't own that had the N-word on there and that his family painted over. Now, I think that's a good story. If you're going to cover that story, I think it's a good story. Instead, he was tagged with that rock. Texas, Rick Perry, must be racist. And they attacked, and they attacked, and they attacked. Done. Who comes next? Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich makes a rise through South Carolina. Interestingly enough, he does it by going after the news media. And then comes the interview with his estranged wife. Now, I don't know who's right and who's wrong, but that's exactly the point. Nobody knows what went on in those conversations except for Newt Gingrich and his wife. You can't take sides on that if you're a journalist. You don't know, unless you're a journalist, in which case you take sides and you go after Newt Gingrich. And they pummeled him and they pummeled him and they pummeled him. Out he goes, Rick Santorum is the last man standing against Mitt Romney. Now folks, did we need to know who his wife dated before Karen ever met him? Did we need to know that story? I don't think that was pertinent to a presidential campaign. 
but it might be pertinent to voters who are pro-life. Kneecapped. You're left with Mitt Romney. Now, that's kind of interesting because there's two theories about this. Why didn't they go after Mitt Romney in the primaries? One conspiracy theory has it that they were setting him up for the general. They're last man standing and there's no alternative to him. Another one is that they didn't fear him the same way they didn't fear John McCain. But then he, when he was the last man standing, they realized they had to go after him. I don't know what the, what, what the truth is. All I know is they didn't go after him in the primaries. They decimated him in the general election. Party of the greedy rich, bank capital, outsourcing jobs, negative, 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 attack, 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 attack. He was buying the presidency, in effect. He didn't care about poor people. And then he did the foolishness of the 47% and they wouldn't let up on that. They knew they had him, and they discombobulated him. So one by one by one, they took out the Republicans while at the same time bowing and genuflecting to Barack Obama. Did it all have an effect? At the end of the day, did the public buy this jihad against the GOP? The numbers out there are rather interesting. There was one poll that was taken by the Gallup organization in August, I think it was, and they asked the public if they trusted the media. It was interesting. 67%, I believe the number is 67%, had little or no trust in the national news media. Only 8% of the public trust the news media a great deal. That's a dramatic number, because you're talking Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, moderates, liberals, and only 8% have a great deal of trust in the national news media. There was a second poll that was taken, I think this one was Rasmussen, and they asked the public, do you believe that the media, the news media, are trying to reelect Barack Obama? Pretty straightforward question. 85% of the public said yes. 85%, now what are you talking about here? You're, let's say every single Republican said that. Then you're talking about half the Democrats are also saying that. Yep, it's true. They're out to, to, to reelect our guy. That's the reality. So that's an avalanche. It's almost nine out of 10 Americans are saying that the media were vested in the reelection of Barack Obama. That tells you something. A poll just came out, again by Gallup, uh, three weeks ago. The next time you hear someone in the press point out how low the approval rating of Congress is, and deservedly so, uh, you can respond if you want to defend Congress you can respond that their approval rating right now is 8%, lower than Congress. That's the national news media. So they're, they, they, they're in a pickle right now because people don't believe what they're saying. Now here's an interesting poll. This is the best one. It's a poll we took. That's why it's the best one. In, on election night, we thought, I mean, I don't know about you, uh, we were convinced that Romney was going to win. I thought he was going to win in a landslide. Uh, so we took a poll trying to ask, trying to determine this. If the public had believed w the media, would Romney have won? This was the way we were looking at it. Now, ultimately, it doesn't make a difference that Obama won, but we look at it. If you ask that question, would you, as a Romney voter, would you have voted for Barack Obama had you believed the media? That was our question. Again, pretty straightforward. The number was shattering. 22.8% of the voters who voted for Mitt, for Mitt Romney said they would have voted for Barack Obama if they had believed the national news media. What does that 22.8% mean? We played a little game. We took 22.8% 22 out of the Romney camp and put it over to the Obama camp in every single state. Just an exercise to see what would happen. The numbers speak for themselves. Barack Obama would have had 512 electoral votes. He would have captured 45 out of the 50 states in America. The Republicans would not have won the three Senate races that they won. And in fact, you might argue they might have lost the House. So worst case scenario, but not completely implausible, is that Republicans would have lost everything and Barack Obama would have had a clear path to socialism in this country had the public believed the news media. Did the news media ultimately deliver four points to Barack Obama? Probably. Would that be, can you call that his margin of, of victory? You could. Um, 
but it could have been a landslide of monster proportions. So it begs the question, what do we do as conservatives? How do we confront this? Well, we have to be realistic about it, and we have to understand what the world is. The first thing we have to do is recognize that it needs to be a top shelf issue for any conservative organization who, that is advancing anything in the public conversation. And it isn't. It's left to groups like the Media Research Center to take care of. That's a mistake. Any organization needs to be confronting with this. And I'll give you an example, the Tea Party. In, uh, at the end of 2010, I think it was, I was doing an event on the West Coast with Herman Cain, with, with the Tea Party Patriots, and uh, I pointed out something, that the number of Americans who were then calling themselves Tea Party members was 48% of the American public. Now that's higher than both parties. So there were more people who were calling themselves Tea Partiers than Democrats. More people calling themselves Tea Partiers than Republicans. And that was a high watermark because what happened after that was what always happens. There are four stages in politics. Stage one is where your enemy ignores you and hopes you go away. Stage two is where your enemy ridicules you and tries to demiss you. If that doesn't happen, stage three, they try to destroy you. And if that doesn't succeed, stage four, they accept you. We're at stage three with the Tea Party movement. And quite honestly, they've been quite successful because the Tea Party movement didn't have a plan to fight back. And the Tea Party movement needs to develop a plan to fight back. So understanding that it's a top shelf issue is the first thing. Secondly, understand what the reality of the news media is today. There's some very, very, very good news here. The news media that are so despicable are dying. They're a dying breed. They're on their way out. The old media is gone. It, I know. You know, good riddance to bad rubbish. Uh, look at the, 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 uh, the networks have lost 50% of their audience in the last 10 years, and they continue to go down. Uh, newspapers, you can, you can line your parakeet cage with the New York Times. That's about the value of it. Um, Newsweek, I know, I know, I know, Newsweek is gone. We feel bad about that. Um, and so many other of uh, these publications are dropping like flies. Um, magazines, uh, 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 newspapers, magazines, television stations, they're all going under. Why? Because there's this new thing called the new media that's on the ascendancy. And the new media is an awesome opportunity for us. Why is that? Because for the first time in modern history, we have the ability to communicate with the American people and not have to go through the prism of Dan Rather or Walter Cronkite or Tom Brokaw or Peter Jennings or Brian Gumbel or anybody else. We can communicate directly one-on-one. -on -one. And that's just started. Social media. Social media is the wave of tomorrow and that allows us to go directly into the homes, directly affect millions upon millions of people like that, instantly with our messaging. So there's great opportunities for conservatives. We have to master those new technologies. That, again, needs to be a top shelf priority. The third thing is, in fighting the left, you have to be, I think, ceaseless, and I think you have to be as courageous and as deliberate as possible. There is this fear that so many have in Washington, D.C., that they might say the wrong thing. They might get the news media really, really mad at them. Ladies and gentlemen, who the hell cares? I mean, <laughs> I mean do we really care what CNN thinks about us? The only people watching that network are people going through airports or in dentist offices. <laughs> Do we really care what the Washington Post writes about us? They've hated us forever. They're not going to like us anymore. And frankly, if they say something nice about us, I kind of worry. And I've told any friend that I have, when they say nice things about you, I'm going to question who you are. It is actually a, not just a badge of courage, but it's a, it's a, it's a positive for the movement. They, they never understood about Ronald Reagan that the more they attacked him, the stronger he got. 
the enemy of my enemy is my friend. They understood, the public understood when somebody was beaten up unfairly. They understood that. If that person stood up to them, Ollie North. It's so many times it's happened where somebody knows to stand up for himself. Now, I'll submit to you that the Republicans didn't in 2012. They didn't know how to confront the news media. So anybody moving forward has to know how to confront them. And it's very simple. You give them the benefit of the doubt the first time, and you chop off their heads the second time, and done. You're done with the exercise. And then you go with the news media and you work with them. So there is very, very good news moving forward. We just have to understand what the new playing field is, not focus on the past, not focus on old technologies. The future for us is very, very good. If we take advantage of it, if we have the courage of our convictions, if we learn, relearn how to speak to the American people, remember this number, and I'll leave you with this number because it's the most encouraging number of them all. How many people in America call themselves conservatives at the high water mark of Ronald Reagan when he was at the top of his popularity? 30%. 30%. After 25 years, 30 years of nonstop hostility against the conservative movement by the national media, what percentage of Americans call themselves conservative today, 46%. We've gone up over 50%. It's not a bad thing that they're attacking us. Attack them back, the American people on our side. Thank you. Thank you. I don't. I don't know if this says three minutes and 10 seconds, does that mean that I take a question? Or do I just ramble on for another three minutes and 10 seconds? Does anybody have a question? Come on, throw a question at me. Yes, ma'am. How do we as individuals take a stand and fight against the media? First, educate your fellow American. Educate your friends exactly as to what's going on. The average person, think about this, the average person on Facebook has 140 friends. So you can immediately influence 140 people simply by passing along what you like to pass along. Secondly, if you pass something along to your friends, here's an interesting statistic. The average television commercial is believed by 14% of the public. You take that exact same commercial, that exact same message, and you put it on Facebook, the believability of it goes up to 78%. Why? Friend to friend. The friend is sending something, so it goes up. So why in the world do Republicans advertise on television? I mean, this is one of the stupidities of the party last year. Why did they spend hundreds of millions of dollars on television? They should have been on the internet. Think about this. Last year was the year of the woman. The year, every year is the year of the woman. I think women should feel good about that. Last year was year of the woman, year of the woman, year of the woman. Nine out of 10 soccer moms are on Facebook every single day. You wanna reach women? That was the way to do it. Romney barely had a presence, barely. They should have done it. So you can go on, that's just one example, social media. You can do that and you can do it instantaneously and people will believe you and they will send it on to their friends, and they will send it on to their friends, and they will send it on to their friends, which is why you can have a good message and you can affect hundreds of thousands of people in about 24 hours. That, that's, the, that, that's the possibility we have. All right, one more question. Yes, sir. <laughs> do I believe that Ben Carson should be more? Of course I do. Um, uh, he's a rock and roll star for, for the movement. Um, but I do worry about him because he's, he's, you know, it's like the Tea Party patriots. It's like the Tea Party candidates that won in 2010. Um, if he, he's got to realize he has a massive bullseye on his head from the national press. Look, they're, 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 their power is diminishing, but they are like rats in a corner. What does a rat in the corner do? It lunges to the jugular, and that's what they're doing. They're going 
ferociously against anybody, and he is the worst of anybody. He's articulate, he's conservative, he's black, and he's courageous. God help him. So, so, so what should he do? He should go forward. But what should you do? Get behind, behind him. Support him at every opportunity. All right, my time is up. Thank you very much.